record on this computer. We are recording. Fantastic. Go full screen. You can hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, beautiful. Um, how many of you have ever meditated before? I've attempted it. <laughs> Can't say I do it every day. No, you tried once before in your life? Yeah. Okay. Julia? Um, only that one time when you brought in that woman from Jax. Okay, cool. Jack. Um, I would like to propose that you have meditated way more times than you know. You're just not calling it meditation. Um, and what I mean by meditation might be something else than what you're thinking of, which is why you're saying you only have done it once or not really. When in reality, the meditation that I'm talking about is something that you do all the time knowingly or unknowingly and you're actually quite good at it and here's my proof have any of you ever in your life felt a sense of resentment towards another person it's okay we're human beings i'm not gonna you know the lightning bolt not shooting down (laughs) hang on jilly's coming in let me just repeat the question because it's important okay hello Hello? I can't hear you guys. I know, you can't hear me. I wasn't actually saying anything. I was just making... Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. I was having an issue where my computer... You had no issue. It was a prank. I I wasn't actually speaking. No, before I was getting on with the link, I tried sending it to myself a million times, but my computer wasn't... No worries. Receiving my text. Okay, no worries. So we just started, and what what I just asked was, how many people have ever meditated before? So you can think about the answer to that question. And whatever your answer is, um, my argument is that you have meditated many, many more times than you think. It's just that you don't call it meditation, you call it something else. So my question to you now is, have any of you ever felt a sense of resentment towards another person? Has it ever happened in your life? Yeah, probably, you're human beings, me too. Um, Do you know the origins of the word resentment? Linguistically, etymologically. Probably something Latin. (laughs) Yeah, most likely. But what does it actually mean? When you you deconstruct the word, what does the word actually mean? It's very simple. Re, the prefix of re means again, right? Sentment is... Sentiment, a feeling. Resentment, resentment basically means to feel a feeling that you felt before once again. That's what a resentment is, right? Your neighbor um, blocks your driveway, so that makes you mad. Disrespected, he's not, he not, he's not answering the phone, you can't get out of the driveway, you're mad at him. Later in the day, Five hours later, you think about it and you get mad again. You're refeeling the feeling you felt before. And it's really, you could like measure it. You could have a physiological reaction. Your blood pressure can go up. Your adrenaline starts to flow. You're ready to punch him in the nose. He's not even here. You haven't seen him in hours. How did you get yourself into such a state? You meditated. So now do you believe in that you've meditated hundreds of times? Mm -hmm. What I mean by meditation is thinking certain thoughts that cause certain feelings. That's all. Thinking certain thoughts that cause certain feelings is a very essential human skill that most human beings are born with naturally, um, the natural ability to do it. And we do it all the time. Not always intentionally, not always with some great goal in mind, but if you felt resentment, you have successfully meditated, man, very successfully. And especially if you have resentment over something that happened a long time ago, like a week ago or a month ago, even a year ago, if you can feel resentment about something that happened two years ago, you are an expert meditator. (laughs) You're, You're a champion meditator. Like it's happened so long ago. So many things have happened since then. 
And yet you're still able to conjure up the feeling just by thinking about what happened. You can get yourself feeling those emotions for real. Right now, whew, you're a really good meditator. But isn't there a caveat with meditation that you're focusing your mind on something, but with the intention of relaxing yourself or putting yourself into a state of calmness? So, so that's, that's what I say. That's why I'm saying that my, my usage of the term meditation is not necessarily in line with that. Nowadays, in our culture right now, the zeitgeist of meditation is very much like what you're describing. Mm -hmm. but, but strictly speaking, meditating as in contemplating an idea over an extended period of time and, and you know, just thinking about one idea, I can, I can go, that, that's just a blank check. I can go in any direction, right? You can think about whatever idea you want to have whatever outcome you want. And if you're smart about it, you're going to choose intentionally which topics to think about because you want to get to certain and you know to certain destinations emotionally. <laughs> so, but I just wanted to start off with this because that's the topic of today's lesson is um, well, there's two topics, but the first segment is um, nearing the end of the book of Tanya. There's ten chapters which we are obviously not going to do anywhere near any sort of justice to. We're going to taste them. But the topic broadly is that we've spoken about before that, you know, developing an emotional congruency is important to the, the self-discipline. We're trying to have self-discipline to control our garments, our thought, speech, and action. Because we know that we have an inter we're always going to be struggling but we don't have to resolve the struggle. We just have to behave. And that's, that's the goal of life is to override our instincts with proper choices and behavior. And in order to do that, you can't just force yourself to be control, control, control. You also have to want it. You have to be emotionally engaged with, with those, those objectives. And we haven't really <clears throat> spoken about, okay, how do you go about building that kind of emotional drive to, to support your self-discipline and support your control of your behavior. Now we're going to talk about that. And in the context of Judaism, in the context of a life that's centered on serving Hashem, with a spiritual mindset, the emotions that you need are emotions that are centered around your relationship with Hashem. And so we're going to be talking about meditation and developing emotions. And that's the topic of these 10 chapters in Tanya. Um, and earlier we just talked about how, hey, Matthew, earlier we just talked about how you, you need to develop emotions, you need to develop feelings for the goals of self-control, not just to tell yourself, oh, I need to control myself, I need to control, that doesn't work. You know what you need to do. We all know what we need to do. We're not motivated enough to do it. So you need the emotional push to be motivated, to be engaged. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm excited about it. I'm going to do it. So we're going to talk about today how to develop those emotions um, in, a, in a spiritual slash religious context that's driven towards um, helping you manage your, your behavior and, and have self-control and self-discipline. Um, so we, we talked about before the idea that naturally we're all wired in a way that the mind can control the heart. Our, our thoughts, whatever we think about, can have an effect on our emotions. Um, and that's useful for all kinds of things. It's a very strong tool that we have at our disposal. It's there. It's, it's comes with the package, you know, it's built in. And we can decide and we can deliberately put ourselves into certain mental states, depending on what we choose to think about. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. You can, you can start yourself. You can, you can be crying in five minutes if you want to just think about sad, depressing things and you'll be crying. Um, you can put yourself into any kind of mood based on what you think. And if you think back to it, you know, most of the many times we're, we're going through the day kind of bouncing from one mood to another, like, like a pinball machine. But really, if you trace it back, what, what, what's, what's creating those moods are the thoughts that we're thinking. It doesn't come out of nowhere. Moods don't just happen. There's a thought process going on. If you're not managing that, if you're not at, you know, at the driver's wheel of your thoughts, then sure, all kinds of thoughts come in and you don't, you don't, 
you know, you don't play the gatekeeper and decide who gets to be thought about and, and not, well, then you end up with all kinds of moods. But fundamentally, all your moods are driven by what you think about. And you have full control over that if you want. So let's start off on, uh, on page 122. It's a bit of a learning activity. I'm going to ask you to play along with learning activity. Um, everybody got it? I left my book at school, I just realized. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll try to make it work. Um, Matthew, you're home? Yeah, I am. Oh, so what time is it there? It's uh, it's ten to eight. So, so you guys are two hours back. Um, one hour, one hour back. I think just one hour. One hour, one hour. Never mind. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you got You got to keep at home or a hat. Maybe you have a Jets hat there. I actually have one on my desk. <laughs> I don't know if I would keep a. That's fine. I probably have one downstairs, but is it a Jets hat though? Tilt down a little. Yeah, that's Jets. Right. Oh, that's a new logo. All right. Okay, so learning activity number one, please do the following. Take 30 seconds and try to think of something right now that will generate positive feelings, whether feelings of being happy or calm or feeling loved, okay? Close your eyes, think for 30 seconds, but you have to think about something that will guarantee make you feel one of those positive emotions, okay? Go. Nice to see the smiles. I don't want to interrupt because you're having such a good time, but um, did that work a little bit? Yeah? So it's really not that hard. My, my, my point is to show you both with the resentment bit and this, um, you're already very good at thinking certain things to feel certain things. You know how to do it. You already have the skill. You already have the ability. You know, it's just a question of what are you going to think about? And then you'll have those feelings and you'll have those moods. Um, and and, you're, and, and the, the glorious thing about it is that any moment you're not, if, you're, if at any time you're not enjoying what you're feeling, just think something else. And looks like now within 30 seconds, you can feel a different feeling. You know, and this is a very, very useful tool for life. In general, whenever things are getting difficult, whenever things are becoming overwhelming, whenever there's whatever's going on around you, stuff hitting the fan, you know, you're in charge. Think about something else. Think, think another train of thought, something that will help you get through whatever you're dealing with, that will, you know, help you take a deep breath and a step back. But it's all coming from your head and you're in charge. You're the pilot. So... When it comes to developing emotions, which is the goal of our class today, the topic of our class today, developing emotions, um, the, the Torah and Tanya speak about how basically all emotion can be broken down into two general, very broad categories. Obviously, within those two broad categories, lots of subcategories and sub emotions, but these are the two broad categories. What are they? Well, one is love or attraction, meaning a feeling of wanting to become closer to or more engaged with or more connected to something, someone. So that broad category, which we'll call love and lots of different sub emotions that fit under that umbrella. The other category would be what's called in Hebrew, yira. And so in Hebrew, love is ahava. And the other category is called yira. Yira is a little bit harder to translate. Um, 
I prefer the word awe. Like when you go to the Grand Canyon, you're like, wow. Nobody loves the Grand Canyon. People are awed by the Grand Canyon, right? Um, or if you go to Mount Rushmore, you're standing up looking at the presidents. Wow, how'd they do that? That's so cool. Or to use a Jewish example, your first time in Jerusalem, you go to the Kotel, the Western Wall, and you're standing there and you're looking at it and you're like, oh my God, wow, I can't believe I'm here. Wow, right? It's not love. It's, it's the greatness of something, the, the immense meaning of something or the, the grandeur of something or the power of something, right? Or if, if you happen to bump into Kyle Lowry on the street, you're like, oh my God, wow. You're in awe, right? Most likely, you're not going to be buddy buddy or lovey dovey with Kyle Lowry if you bump into him on the street. You'd be like, oh, Kyle, Kyle. So you're, just, you're awed by the greatness of the person, or like, oh my God, he's so much greater, much bigger than me, so much whatever, more than me, more something, right? Richer, better at three point shooting, more famous, you name it. More than me, I'm small, you're big. Oh, so that's yira, which would be awe. Sometimes it's translated as fear, which is a more literal translation. Um, and as long as you don't go into a sense of fear in a unhealthy way, like fear of being abused, then it's okay to use that, that word as well. I just, I'm reluctant to use it as a translation because it can be misunderstood, especially when we're talking about Hashem, we're developing a love for Hashem or a fear of Hashem. The fear of Hashem is just like, ah, don't hit me. That's not what we're talking about. It's the same kind of fear slash awe you would feel, you know, bumping into a celebrity or going to the Kotel for the first time and so on. It's not a, you're not afraid of the Kotel. You're not afraid of the Grand Canyon. You're not afraid of Kyle Lowry. He's not going to do anything to you. It's just like, oh, wow. You shrink, right? You, 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 you become smaller in his presence. Suddenly, it's, it's not about you. Um, so these are the two broad, the two general categories of all emotion. And with love, we are attracted to come closer to something. With awe, we are in retreat from something. We are more restrained in the face of something. We become smaller and we just look at that and that becomes bigger. Um, and so basically the goal that Tanya is describing in these 10 chapters is being that you can control what you think about and that that has a direct effect on what you feel and how you feel. That means that you have the ability to not only control what you do, but you can actually control how you feel and how you feel is going to be very helpful in getting you to behave a certain way. Because if you can feel excited about doing something, pretty good chance you're going to do it. As opposed to if you only, all you have going for you is a sense of duty or obligation. I must do it. I should do it. I need to do it. But you're not motivated. You don't care. You're not excited about it. There's no love or awe. Right? You can do things out of either one of those. Anytime you do something for somebody else, that's the general rule that Tanya describes. Anytime you're doing something for somebody else, you're definitely being motivated by one of these two general emotions or, or a sub feeling, right? So if you're going to do something for your parents, you're either motivated by a sense of love or a sense of awe. There's got to be something there. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't move. You would just stay put. Anytime you do something for somebody else, it's, a mo it's motivated by, by a love or it's derivative, or a sense of awe, or it's derivative. Fair? Um, by the way, parenthetically, this is where you get access to a very rich aspect of Judaism and Jewish life. Because if, if Judaism to you is only about the deeds, do this, don't do that, then you sort of Judaism is only at the level of behavior. Judaism has nothing to say about your, in, your inner world. 
the moment that you enter into this space, you go a little bit scuba diving spiritually, and you start to, okay, I need to develop my emotions in line with my ideal behaviors, right? So I know I'm not allowed, I know I'm not, I may not eat bread on Pesach, to use a simple example, right? But I don't really care, or it's hard, or I'm really hungry, and uh, nobody's watching, whatever. It's a very dry level of observance. Either you do it or you don't. But if you're able to engage emotionally with it, so first of all, you just become a deeper person. You yourself become a person of depth because you're engaging and thinking about your inner world and you're trying to work on yourself and, and develop and grow certain emotions that should feed and sustain and support the, the behaviors that you're trying to, to abide by. Um, and in Chabad culture, there's a tremendous emphasis on, it's a lifelong journey of being aware of your inner world, being aware of your feelings, where they're at, and, and trying your best to nudge yourself in that direction. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs in this, in this department, right? Uh, in the Department of Emotions, it could sometimes be a roller coaster. But we have, uh, you know, our lifelong goal is to be engaged emotionally as we're trying to, to observe the Torah and practice the mitzvot and everything. Part of that, a big part of that is to be engaged emotionally. Quick story. Quick story on that note. Um, one of the Hasidim, one of the students of the Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, was a great scholar who wrote many books of his own. Um, many of the Alter Rebbe's followers were tremendous scholars in their own right. He attracted the brightest minds of the time in the European Jewish community. So one of his students was walking down the street once and he noticed a Russian soldier being flogged, getting, you know, getting whipped. So he asked the commander, what did this guy do to deserve the whipping? He said, well, he was on guard duty at night and his feet froze in his boots. It was that cold, you know, Russian winter, 40, 50 below, almost like Winnipeg. And they, uh, his feet froze in his boots and he got frozen in place. So they're whipping him. Julia, this sounds very Russian, right? Bad, it's not bad enough the poor guy was stuck outside. It's not bad enough that his feet froze. That's also a crime. He has to get punished for that. Like, sadistic. Um, you will practice piano now. So, so the rabbi asked the commander, he says, I don't understand. Like, why is it his fault that his feet froze in his boots? The poor guy, it's 30 below. What do you want from him? So the commander said, you don't understand. When this soldier, like all soldiers, when he entered into the service, into the army, he took an oath of service and he swore to serve the czar. And that oath of service should have kept him warm. Because it didn't, he's getting flogged. They don't make him like that anymore. So the rabbi said, this story gave me inspiration in serving Hashem for 25 years. Because it taught him, obviously, the message was that you have to feel excited. You have to develop emotions as part of your service. It's not enough. He was doing the job. He was standing on guard. He did the deed. You know? What the soldier's job? Stand on guard, hold your gun, look around. He was doing all that. One small problem. He wasn't excited. He wasn't passionate about it. He wasn't, yeah, he wasn't fully present. He was just doing it. And that was, that was why he got flogged. So he got the whips and the rabbi got the lessons and we got the story. But that's, that's a big part of, of life as a Jew is, is to not only do the deed, but to make sure that you're as, as engaged emotionally as you possibly can. So, and again, we're, we're not aiming to become perfect people. We're never going to become the tzaddik who doesn't have any struggle. But we are capable, as we all just saw, we are all capable of developing emotions and developing feelings. It's just a question of what we think about. And later in the class, we're actually going to try some exercises 
based on the teachings of Tanya, the recipes of how to actually develop a feeling for serving Hashem, a feeling for doing a mitzvah. It's possible. can be done. Any questions? No? I think it makes perfect sense. Amazing. Um... Okay, so let's go on. We're going to do a reading now, text number one. You know what, Jilly? Um, Matthew, you have the book with you or no? Yeah, I do. You do? Wow, you brought it home to Winnipeg. Whew. Respect. I was thinking about you, Moishi. I was like, I need to bring I feel this. it, man. I, I am very touched, honestly. That's beautiful. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, Jilly, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. Don't worry. Uh, Matthew did something extra. You're not bad. Let me just, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pull it up on the screen because thanks to the miracle of the internet, the text of Tanya is online. So I will send you the link and then you can follow along as well. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. Okay. Where's my chat at? There we go. Ready? Jill, you're watching? It's so amazing. I am typing in Waterloo. You're in Toronto. You're going to see it in like in a second. It's crazy. It's crazy. Watch. Bam. See that? Just like that. Isn't that crazy? It's wild. Okay, so click that link, and then the text that we're reading will be right at the top. The as mentioned? Or one must? Um, you know what? Let me just take a quick look at it and make sure. Uh, yeah, one, one month. Yeah, yeah. Skip, okay. skip, skip that like shaded box and go to the actual text. One must. One must, however, constantly bear. Hang on, on hang on, hang on, hang on. One second, one second. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, let's do that. So, Jilly, you can read. Um, I'll tell you where to read until. Read until. Um, hang on. Okay. Uh, it's going to be quite a long reading. Um, right. you're, you're skipping the shaded boxes. Ignore the shaded yeah, boxes. Yeah. You're going to go about. Um, that's not that long. The paragraph ends, where is it? Like one standing before the king. That's the ending of the paragraph. It's uh, a few clicks of the, of the mouse down. Okay. Um, everybody else has it in the book, right? One must. Text number one, page 122. Okay. All right. Rock one must, however, constantly bear in mind what is the beginning of divine service as well as its core and root. This means although fear is the root of turn away from evil and love is the root of do good, nevertheless, it is not sufficient to awaken the love alone to do good. But at the no. very least... One second, one second, sorry. Just to, just to clarify, you guys who have the book, you're a little bit confused because the book takes a little bit of editorial license. The line that Jilly just read that you don't have in the book is just where you see there's like dot, 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 the ellipse in the Hebrew... So Jilly's reading the full quote. We have like, I would say 80% of the full quote that Jilly's reading. So just if you if you if you hear her going on and you don't see the, the words in your book, just hang on. You'll meet up again in a second. She's just reading an extra line. Okay. Continue, please. But at the very least, before performing the positive command, one must first arouse the innate fear which lies hidden in the heart of every Jew, not to rebel against the supreme king of kings the Holy One, blessed be he, as has been stated above, so that this fear should manifest itself in his heart, or at least in his mind. This means that in order to arouse within himself the later category of fear, he should at least contemplate in his mind the greatness of the blessed Ein Sof and his kingship which extends to all worlds, both higher and lower, bearing in mind that the greater the king's dominion, 
the more awe it inspires in his subjects and let him further consider that he fills all worlds, animating them with an indwelling life force that created beings can experience and comprehend and encompasses all worlds. He also animates them with a life force that transcends the experience and comprehension of created beings. As it is written, do I not fill heaven and earth? Yet he leaves aside the creature of the higher worlds and the creatures of the lower worlds. He uniquely bestows his kingship upon his people in upon his people Israel in general, for God is known as King of Israel, and upon him in particular, for a man is obligated to say, For my sake was the world created. And he for his part accepts his kingship upon himself, that he be king over him, to serve him, and to do his will in all kinds of servile work. And behold, God himself stands over him, and the whole world is full of only, full only with his glory, and not only being omnipresent does he see everything, but moreover he scrutinizes him in particular, and searches his reins and heart, his innermost thoughts and emotions, to see if he is serving him as fitting. Therefore, he must serve in his presence with awe and fear, notes the Rebbe not merely like one who is located in the king's domain, but moreover like one standing before the king. Perfect. One must mediate. That's it. That's it. That's it. That, that was oh, it. that's it? Okay. I mean, that was it. That was, that was quite a reading. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. So that was a lot of information, right? We're going to break it down. We're going to break it all down. We're going to spend a few minutes on this reading, going going back over it bit by bit. I just want you to get sort of a overall sense. Now we're going to we're going to chop it up. So as I mentioned before, um, I have a personal pet peeve when people misrepresent the concept of fear of God, or you have heard the expression "he's a God fearing person." It's not. Ah, please don't hurt me. Uh, matter of fact, if if a person does have that kind of relationship where God is this scary being that's going to hurt you if you don't obey and therefore you follow the mitzvahs, you're actually not serving God. You're basically just acting out of self-preservation. You don't want to get zapped. So it's very different than, you know, if you bump into Kyle Lowry on the street and you're in awe of Kyle Lowry, that's about Kyle Lowry. But if you bump into Kyle Lowry and you're like, ah, Kyle, don't hurt me then the, the subject of your emotion is yourself, not Kyle, right? You're, 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 you're scared for your own safety. Kyle happens to be the bully in, in your conception in this case, right? So that's really not at all what we mean when we say fear of God or awe of God. Um, what he's saying in this reading is that awe is the primary emotion. The first emotion that you bring into the, into the relationship between you and Hashem starts off foundational is awe, not love. Love will come. That's the first floor, second floor up, the penthouse, but not at the foundation. The foundation has to be awe. We're going to explain why in a minute. Um, but again, it's about that sense of feeling like you're in the presence of something great, something much more, a greater magnitude than yourself. Um, and as a result, you, you shrink in your own eyes. You, you pale a little bit in significance. You, you don't become, you're not, you're not as self-important as you may have thought you were before because you're in the presence of something really great and you feel awe. Um, another way of, and there's a few different angles. Like I said, there's a few different ways of, of describing this feeling in, in the context of a relationship with Hashem. Another angle on the fear slash awe would be that you're afraid um, of, of perhaps not properly respecting the relationship you have with Hashem, or you're afraid of losing that relationship with Hashem. So that's a driving force because you, because you value the relationship and you're, you're, you have anxiety about losing it. You, you're afraid of losing it. You don't want to become a person who loses all connection to God. Therefore, that motivates you to maintain your connection by performing mitzvahs, which we know are the the bread and butter of the relationship of the connection. Is right? this so, specific to the con in the context of God? Or is this more like an example showing 
what we can do with our emotions and so, how. No, so, so the goal in Tanya is it's not a self-help book per se. It's a self-help book about serving God and being a Jew and giving you insight into the deeper levels of the religious spiritual experience. That being said, all these principles can very easily be carried over to human relationships between, you know, husband and a wife, two friends, parents and children, all your relationships. So just, just for example, it's, it's good you brought that up. Um, the Rebbe actually once wrote that just like you have to meditate about certain ideas in order to develop a feeling of love for Hashem, the same thing is true because we have a mitzvah of loving our fellow Jew. So the same thing is true. You have to actually meditate about your friend's qualities. Every now and then, it's a good thing to do. You think about, you know, my roommate is just the most considerate person ever. They're always cooking me food, right? They, they do so many things to make my life easier. They're such a pleasure to be around. They are truly awesome. And if you think about that for 60 seconds, guaranteed you're going to feel a deeper feeling of love for that person than you ever felt before, right? And same thing for parents, for, for anybody, right? That's what keeps the relationship really vibrant. It's not just whatever, we're in a routine. We, uh, duh, duh, duh. Like you take time to think about it. And you know what's really amazing? If you tell them what you thought about and how it made you feel, ooh Try that with your future spouses. Thank me later. Okay. So, so that was just an, an aside about that. But back to back to developing emotions for Hashem. Um, my point is that awe slash fear is not supposed to be an unpleasant feeling. It's not a negative emotion. Anxiety, depression are negative emotions. Not that you're not allowed to feel them, but just negative because they're unpleasant and, and not productive. They're not good for you, per se. Of course, they're valid. Of course, they're part of the human experience, and, and we, we embrace that. We embrace the good, the bad, the ugly in life. It's all part of being a human being. But awe slash fear is not in the same package of negative emotions as anxiety, depression, and stress doesn't belong in that in that category at all. It's a positive emotion. You know, I, I never understood. Sometimes you have politicians who make these wonderful speeches, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not driven by fear, only love. Like, why is fear bad? Fear is a great thing. Don't you want to be respected? Shouldn't we have a fear of fire? Like, these are good things. This is not a negative thing that we should just castigate it and denigrate it and throw it out the window. It's, it's whatever. If you ever go into politics, please promise you won't make a speech, you know, bashing fear. Right? Don't, don't take the easy, the easy shot like that. Okay, so let's break this down. Um, the beginning of this reading, text one, said that one must first arouse, uh, one must, sorry, one must, however, constantly bear in mind what is the beginning of the service of God as well as its core and root. What is step number one? Serving Hashem. Step number one is the innate awe everybody has you have already the capacity you have already in potential you have this built into you awe of god what does that mean every relationship starts off by me recognizing that i end at some point and you begin a recognition of the other person if i don't ever have a moment where i become aware that I, my being, my existence, my life, my world stops and you begin, we will never be able to have a relationship. I will always just consume you. I will overwhelm you and we will never be able to connect. So the beginning of every relationship, step one, ground zero of the relationship is um, I actually do not fill all space. I stop at some point. My being ends, yours begins. And that's, that's, the, that's the ground level of, of respect in a relationship. Okay. Um, so that's, that's point number one. Number two. What we need to do 
is generate and develop a feeling of awe um, that will bring us to the to the state where we are we are not going to rebel against God. Because again, the respect slash awe is what drives your restraint of what you will not do out of respect. Right? In every relationship, again, just to contrast with love, I love you, therefore I will do things for you. I love you so much that I went to the mall, got you a present, cooked dinner because it's your birthday. I do those out of love. By the same token, I have an appreciation and a love for Hashem, and therefore I light the Shabbos candles. And therefore, I make sure to buy kosher meat. And so on. Therefore, I invite guests and I, I do acts of kindness and so on and so forth. But what you don't do out of respect is never driven by love. It's driven by respect. Right? So, you know, your spouse doesn't like when you burp at the dinner table so you make sure not to burp out of respect it's not out of love i love you so much i'm not burping no no that's not what it is it's i respect you i take you seriously i i I, i'm not dismissive of your concerns and your preferences therefore i shall not burp right so you see how how you need in a relationship, you need to have both tracks and it's actually the respect slash awe track that needs to come in first because otherwise nothing will ever get going as a relationship. I, I don't take you seriously as a person to begin with. How, how can we even talk about a relationship? The first ingredient is respect, awe. I make place for you. I hold back on myself and I create space for you. That's ground zero. Okay, the next line was that you should at least contemplate in your mind because the point is that not always will you be successful in generating full-fledged, you know, red-blooded emotion. Sometimes your meditation will only give you what we spoke about, I think it was in class number two, that sort of, um, what was the word for it? I forget what the word was, but we, we talked about how a, a certain meditation can give you a a, uh, a certain clarity of this is how things ought to be. And to some degree, that's enough. It might not give you the full emotion, but even if all you can sort of squeeze out of a meditation is the sense of this is how things ought to be, sometimes that could be sufficient. So don't, don't, don't be uh, dismissive if that's all that comes out of it. He's saying the bare minimum, try to get to that stage. Obviously, our goal is really to have an emotion and a feeling but try at least to have that sense of, you know, what's proper. Um, what are you going to be thinking about? Okay, so here's the important, the important ingredient. What is the topic of the meditation that leads you to feeling a sense of awe slash respect for God? The topic is a, a two-sided coin. His greatness, which translates to your smallness. Okay. Let's, let's walk this through for a second. Here's an infinity meditation, okay? The infinity meditation basically works like this. How much space do you take up right now relative to your chair? How much space of the chair do you take up? Hmm? 65% of it. 65%? <laughs> Is that much chair? You have a big chair. Kind of long, tall. Okay. Fine. <laughs> Seventy. You okay? Seventy-five. <laughs> I hope I hope nobody's taking up less than fifty percent of the chair. Okay, most of the chair you, you don't feel like okay. There's there's this like there's this little spot here that I'm not using, right? Okay, fine. So, but fundamentally, a human being sits in a chair. You're you're taking up most of the chair, right? The average chair, the average person. How much space do you take up relative to the entire room? A lot less, right? How much space do you take up relative to the entire house? Depends how big your house is, but still significantly less. 
Okay, you see where this is going, but but let's think it through, because the the power of the meditation is only if you actually think through the idea, not just say yeah 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 okay get to the end already. No no that's not going to get you the same feeling. The feeling will all depend on what you think about. So think it through. So okay so I take up a lot of the chair, I take up a little bit less of the room, I take up even less of the house. Um, how much room do you take up relative? How much space do you take up relative to your entire block? I don't even know. I don't even know if it's 10%. I'm sure it's not 10%. 1%? Is it even 1%? You could probably fit 100 of you on the block and still be room for more. So it's not even 1%, right? How much space do you take up relative to your city? Already, it's like you don't exist. Right? Would your city notice if you weren't there? Has anybody ever gotten a, a letter from the mayor? It's like, oh, you came home. Wow, we noticed. Thank you. Nobody knows if you come and go. Sorry. Okay. Ready? We all live in Canada. Canada is very big. How much space do you take up relative to Canada? You are a joke. Not you as in you, but all of us, each of us are a joke compared to the vastness of Canada. Right? I'm not even going to Ontario. Never mind. Just, just Let's go straight to Canada. How small am I in contrast with the entire Canada? Tiny. Tiny. Right? You with me? Like you're feeling a little bit of the tininess? You think about it. Just think about it. You're tiny compared to Canada. Um, let's zoom out a little bit more. How much space do you take up relative to North America? This is, this is already a ridiculous question. Right? This is becoming like a joke. What are you kidding me? How much space do I take up relative to North America? There's only one person in North America who thinks he takes up any space relative to North America and he's about to leave the White House. <laughs> okay, and one more time. Two more, actually. How much space do you take up relative to the entire world? And, and think about, and it, it, you can even visualize in your head, like, you know, on Google Maps, you can zoom in or out. Like visualize in your head, like the satellite map right over your house. So you can still see your house and you can point to the spot where you are in the house and zoom out till you don't see your house anymore. And then you don't see your city anymore. And then you don't even see your country anymore. You don't even see your, your, your continent anymore because you've zoomed out to the Milky Way. Now, do you matter? Do you register? You're not even there. I mean, you're there, but like spec, tiny, tiny spec. Um, the crazy thing is that all that we've just described is still within the realm of that which is finite and measurable. We've just compared ourselves to something that's way, way bigger than us, but it's still finite, still has a definition, can be measured, can be seen, and so on. Me, in contrast to the Milky Way, oh yeah. Now, Hashem is the creator of all of this and stands beyond all of that and is truly infinite and Hashem is just beyond everything that we can grasp and then try to say to yourself, okay, so what kind of space and how do I register vis-a-vis -vis Hashem? That's the, that's the recipe. If you think about that, it's a very simple idea, but it's a very powerful idea. If you think about that, just ask yourself that question. How do I register vis-a-vis -vis Hashem? What kind of space do I take up vis-a-vis -vis Hashem and so on? 
It's a mind blowing question. You can't even you can't even start to like picture that in your head. You don't even know what that even looks like. We say the words, but it's already it's already a mind blowing idea. And so the result of that meditation should be a sense of awe for how awesome, literally how awesome in the most literal sense of the word Hashem is and how small I am. Not small in the sense of you don't matter or you, you're irrelevant, but small in the sense of I'm clearly not the, the important being in the story here. Did we lose someone? No. Oh. Right? Small in the sense of I am not the center of the universe. I am not where it's at. That should be clear to a person and you should feel it. Not just know it. Feel it. If you, if you think about that and meditate on that. Was that clear? Did you guys understand? Any, any points? That need, uh, try to elaborate on something? Any questions? We're good? Okay. Um, so that's one point you meditate about is the greatness of Hashem, the greatness, what he calls here, the greatness of the blessed infinite, which is always a much cooler way than just saying God. What are you thinking about today? The blessed infinite. Sounds cool. What are you thinking about today? God. Ooh, weirdo. The blessed infinite. I had a, there was a, there was a master student here a number of years ago who just had a, an allergic reaction to the word God. Whatever, he just uh, made him nervous. But he wasn't, he wasn't like an atheist. He just didn't, like, whatever. It was just a, one of his hangups. And we discovered that if I say the word infinite, he loves it. And he knows that I mean God. He just, it's a different word, right? Choice of words matters. So from then on, in all our conversation, we just say the infinite. You know, the infinite said you should put on tefillin. You got five minutes? For the infinite, anything. So anyway, sometimes the language, a little switch in the language helps. Okay. Isn't this kind of like the, like an exist? can't people have like an existential crisis thinking about this all the time? Thinking about how insignificant they are? What do you mean? Elaborate the question. I, li I like the question. What do you mean? Because if someone's having an existential crisis, it just means that they feel like they have no purpose in life. So if you feel like you're literally less than a speck on this earth and you have zero purpose, you are just tiny and insignificant. Doesn't that make you feel some sort of way <laughs> that your life is more, meaning <laughs> more suicidal? Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, it's kind of I avoid those thoughts because I don't want to feel so <laughs> insignificant. <laughs> So it's a very, very good question, Kayla. Excellent, excellent question. Um, very briefly, I'll tell you this. The difference is, are you trying, is a person trying, I, I say you, I don't mean you, Kayla Saul. Yeah. Okay, just don't take it personally. I mean, take it personally, but not, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. Are you trying to be whole? Or are you trying to be to, to execute the purpose for which you were created. Are you trying to serve or are you trying to be whole? For a person who's trying to be whole, which is understandable, they're doomed to failure because human beings are broken. Human beings are categorically flawed, weak, and broken. So if your goal is to be whole, good, righteous, successful, uh, right to be right i, I want to do the right thing i want to be right you're doomed to failure you're always gonna you're always going to um you know have egg on your face i actually wrote a note about this believe it or not this is on my mind like yesterday so i jotted down like a rant can i read you my rant please <laughs> okay um I, I hope i hope i'm not doing this just for kayla you guys are with me yeah Okay, so here's the rant. If you start off wanting to be good, right, correct, successful, or proper, aka whole, you will fail often and inevitably be frequently disappointed, ashamed, and hurt. 
Since this is most unpleasant, you will seek ways to ameliorate the yuckiness. Ameliorate means to make it better. What are the ways you might seek to make the yuckiness better? One is ignoring or pushing it out of sight and mind, but it will always come back. That yucky feeling, you might try to overwhelm it with more attempts to become whole, but it will, it will always come back. And you might try to deal with the yuckiness by accepting that you will never be truly whole, but that means that you give up and you cross over to the dark side of nihilism, where basically nothing matters, you're full of despair, and you're a terrible cynic. And the yuckiness will absolutely not leave you now. And I'm sure there are other ways too. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. However, if you start off knowing that you're flawed, weak, and cosmically insignificant, meaning, this is the point we're talking about, you're categorically not whole by definition, but also knowing that that's not why you're even here. Hashem did not put you here so that you can become whole. You are here to channel divine light into the darkness, like uh, Leonard Cohen said, through the cracks. That's how the light gets in, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know that, then there are no grounds to feel yucky about being broken. Because A, that's the default normal position. B, you're not here to fix that. You don't have to fix the brokenness. It's fine. You have to you have to use it and refocus re on your goal and your mission, which is you are sent here to shine and channel divine light into the darkness through the cracks and the brokenness. Because you're broken, because you're, you have all those flaws, you are then able to communicate light to the brokenness of the world. If you were not broken at all, you would not be able to talk to, you would not have the language of the broken. And you cannot shine light into where things are broken and dark. You need something? You need a sharpener? Do it outside, please. Um, and so we're going to talk more about this at the end of the class, if, if we get there. But the key thing is that it's not a liability. You know, your brokenness basically is, is, is the result of your ego, your animal soul, your body. That's where the brokenness comes from. Like your soul, your godly soul is never broken. It's always holy and great. It's always in the light. There's the other part of you that where the brokenness comes from, that's not a liability. That's the big thing. It's not a liability because that's what gives you access into the world of darkness and brokenness where you can then shine light. You need it. But you don't need it in the sense of, yay, I'm broken, stop right there. You need it in the sense of, I'm broken, I, I know what it's like to be empty and lost and confused. And that's why I and you know I speak that language. I'm bilingual. Right? I could be the translator. I can translate from divine light to utter brokenness and existential dread. Um, so there's no reason to feel yucky about being broken. A certain calm and ease develops in your self-concept and you shed the existential discomfort you previously knew. Having accepted your essential brokenness, the mentality shifts to being centered on something other than yourself. Because that's what you were centered on the whole time before, right? When the yuckiness of the heaviness of being and your failures and your your, your, your darkness and your brokenness consumed you, you were basically thinking about yourself and yourself and yourself and yourself. And that's the problem. You want to be centered on something other than yourself. Ideally, you become centered on Hashem, what He needs from you, which also includes service to others, other people. It's not just a religious trip in the sense of flying to heaven. It means that you take everybody except yourself more. You, th you take everything and everybody more seriously than you take yourself. Um, a close second, a close second to that outcome would be just to take other people more seriously and to be centered on the needs of others. A person can't reach the level of being centered on Hashem. At the very least, be centered around other people. 
That doesn't mean that you're like a, a, a disposable rag that just does whatever everybody else wants you to do. It just, you know what I mean? It, it means that you're not self-centered and what people need from you. Another result is that you can more easily and naturally find joy in every day. After all, it's a great gift to be alive and be able to contribute. So what, and we already decided that being broken is not a, not a big deal that you thought it was. And finally, ironically and hilariously, you feel more whole this way than ever before. Did any of that make sense? You're just shifting the mindset from saying, okay, so I'm insignificant. I can look at it from that perspective or I can say, well, everyone else is insignificant, um, but I can bring light to my life in, in some ways if I look at it from a different perspective, saying like, I don't need to be this whole human being that's like dominant over the world. <laughs> I could be still insignificant and significant at the same time. That's exactly it. So does that answer your question? How this doesn't lead to becoming more suicidal? Yeah, it does actually. Okay, good. So that's the idea. Yes, you are insignificant. You think about me versus the, the Milky Way. Oh my God, I'm nothing. Might as well jump off a bridge. No, you're not nothing in the sense of you don't matter. You're nothing in the sense of you are not to consider yourself to be self-important. You are, you, are, you are wrong if you put yourself at the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're here means that you're needed, of course. You matter and you're significant, but in a context, not because you're that important. So if you have a YouTube channel and all you talk about is what you ate for lunch, please do us all a favor. Choose another topic. I don't mean choose another topic of not, not what you did for lunch, but what you did after lunch. Like, stop talking about yourself so much. It's not all you. Um, okay. And so you're thinking about Hashem's greatness. You're thinking about Hashem's kingship. What does it mean Hashem is a king? We don't even know what a king means. We haven't seen a king in our lifetimes. But the idea of a king in the Torah is as a, basically a code word for having a relationship. Why? Because a true king can only be king because the people choose him as king, almost like, a, like an election. The Torah's idea of a king is that the people speak and the people say, we choose you as the king. In the mitzvah of appointing a king, the Torah says you shall uh, appoint for yourself a king. That the people determine who the king will be. Otherwise, he's not a king. He's just a, a dictator who seized power. And so by, by referring to Hashem as a king, we're not just saying he's almighty, all-powerful, can do whatever he wants. He's a real king. We're also saying he's a king because we make him a king, which means we have a relationship and we establish him as our king. Um, and that means that it's a two-way street. He wants to have a relationship with us as well. That's where we get our significance from. You could try to get your significance from yourself. You're going to be disappointed and you're going to make a lot of mistakes doing that. That's a very, very poor source for significance. You could also get your sense of significance from Hashem who created you and gave you a reason for being and a purpose in this world and a mission in life. That's a whole different kind of significance. And it's not going to make you an arrogant SOB. If that's where you get your significance from, you're not going to become the most annoying jerk in the world who nobody wants to hang out with. I'm significant because I'm here to serve, and that includes serving you. How could that person be annoying? How could that person be a pain to be around? The person a joy to be around? They're light on their feet. They're normal. They're an amazing person. Um... Let's skip a little bit. I know we're running out of time. Let's skip a little bit to the end of that reading. Um, Behold, Hashem, Hashem stands over you. Uh, you see that part? Behold, Hashem stands over him, over him, over you, whatever. This is all like the, Al the Alter Rebbe is describing what you should be thinking, right? So this is your all your meditation. Um. 
you need to think about that you're in the presence of Hashem. Hashem is always in front of you. There, there's no nowhere in the world, no time or space that you could ever be where you're not in the presence of Hashem. Hashem is the ultimate truth of existence. The truth is everywhere. There's no spot in the world where two plus two is not four. There's no state of mind where two plus two is not four. What's true is true all the time, all, all the place. And so you want to just remind yourself, um, hello, I'm standing in front of the truth. You know, you just bumped into Kyle Lowry, like right now, and he's there all the time. Where, wherever you go, he's like, hello. Ooh, sorry, Kyle, didn't notice you were there. You know, um, Hashem is always in front of you. Hashem is always right there. Um, that's not meant to be creepy. It's meant to be empowering. It's creepy if you really, if you, if, you know, God forbid someone is in a very toxic mood and they really don't want, I, I don't want to think about God right now. I just, I would love to have some BLT. Please God go away. You know, um, then, then it becomes creepy. Oh, God's still here. Oh, can't get away from this guy. Um, but we hope that those moods are few and far between. Um, but if you're if you're not in such a mood, then the knowledge that you're in the presence of Hashem can actually be a motivator and uh, a, a, an empowering thing for you, um, because it gives you the strength to you know push back against inertia, against your animal soul, against your own body's laziness. Like oh, I can't just sit here do nothing. I'm in the presence of Hashem. Hello. Like, every moment counts. Every minute of life is a big deal. Like obviously on a spectrum, we. we takes time to really integrate this into our into our life into our personality it takes takes work to integrate this but this is the basic thought process that, that we want to be on um, and you can't hide Hashem is always inspecting you to see if you're serving him appropriately and therefore if you're always in Hashem's presence you should always be with awe like one standing before the king This section that we just read, this, this excerpt from chapter 41 of Tanya is something that I would suggest everybody can incorporate as a daily meditation in the morning. As a matter of fact, the Rebbe would recommend the people to, to do this, to meditate on this quote, this section of Tanya before the morning prayers. Um, because this is really how you grow up. This is what makes you into a mature human being. This is, what, this is how you grow out of yourself. This is how you grow out of being obsessed with yourself and worried about yourself and concerned about yourself. And if you're not good enough and you are good enough, this is the ticket to freedom. This is the ticket to real liberation and, uh, and maturity. And most importantly, uh, a real awareness and relationship with Hashem. So you have the text with you now. We've studied it. Um, tomorrow morning, you all have time. I know you all have time. Uh, my challenge to you is try to think about this, read it over, think about it for five minutes, see what happens. Try your best, give it a give it a shot, see what happens. I'm I'm willing to wager, I'm willing to bet that it will give you some sort of emotional reaction. The reaction will be a reaction of awe. Of you know you'll you'll take things a little bit more seriously, and you won't be that quick or that easy to lazy around um, and just do whatever. It, it, it'll help. It's a very healthy thing. Um, as a matter of fact, a similar idea is at the beginning of the Code of Jewish Law. Code of Jewish Law starts off by saying that. Um, the righteous place God before them always. And the idea is that you, you don't behave the same way in front of other people as you do uh, when you're alone. Right? I think everybody here can probably vouch for that, that if you're alone in the apartment and your roommates aren't home, you might do certain things that you would never dream of doing if they're around. For some people, it's to swig, you know, pop from the bottle. Like if people are around, they're pouring into a cup. I mean, nobody's... Right. Ice cream from the container, like nobody's here, whatever. But if people are watching you, you know, you're a little bit more circumspect, you, you behave a little bit different if people are around. 
Um, and there's actually a, one of the rabbis in the Talmud on his deathbed told his students, um, was it on his deathbed? Hang on, I want to misquote this. No, I don't know if it was on his deathbed. But one of the rabbis in the Talmud blessed his students. He gave him a very interesting blessing. He said, I bless you that your fear of God should be as much as your fear of a human being. You should fear God as much as you fear a human being. What does that mean? And the students were like, what? He said, yes, because you don't behave the same way in private as you do when there's people around. Guaranteed you're more moral when people are around than when not. And so if nobody's watching, there's one kind of behavior. But if somebody's watching, there's a different kind of behavior. So he said, I want you to, I want you to behave as if someone's watching the whole time, basically. That was his blessing to his students, a very wise blessing. I want you to behave as if someone's watching the whole time because someone is watching the whole time. You can just, you know, ignore it. But someone's watching the whole time. So you have to behave that way. And that's, that's part of this meditation is to remind yourself someone's watching the whole time. Hashem, Hashem is watching the whole time. Uh, how are we on time? What are we? Oh my God, eight minutes left. Okay, I'll try to zoom ahead. Um, in a mature relationship, like we said before, respect slash awe comes before love. Love without respect, for those of you God forbid, might still be under the influence of hippie thinking that all you need is love. It's not true. It's a lie. You need more than love. The Beatles were wrong. Um, should I prove it to you? The proof is, the proof is, have you ever seen a kid who doesn't want to be hugged? You ever encounter such a kid? They exist among us. Maybe you were such a kid who at some point was like, no, don't hug me. And whether it's that really mushy great aunt or that creepy uncle or whatever it is, or a random stranger at a whatever, and they hug you anyway because they love you so much. Does that kid feel loved? How does that kid feel? Uncomfortable. <laughs> Not love. Disrespected. Yes. Disrespected, uncomfortable, like all terrible, terrible feelings. Considering this person supposedly loved them. Like, how did we go so wrong? Started off with all lots of mushy love, but the kid felt nothing but horror and disgust. Disrespect, uncomfortable. What happened? All you need is love. No. You need love. And you need respect. And then we can talk. And then we can have a relationship. Now we have ground to stand on. You know? So I love you, I love you, I love you. I, I buy flowers on your anniversary, on our anniversary. Do I call to say I'm running late? Don't worry about me. I'll be home in 20 minutes, 20 minutes later than usual. Yeah, it's fine. We love each other. What are you what are you saying? You know, um, or, you know, the, the, the stereotypical, I don't have to dress up anymore. We're married. He knows what I look like. It's fine. Where's the respect? Right. And, and all sorts of examples like that. Um, so in, in the context of a relationship with Hashem, you can have a person who likes to do mitzvahs, but will also very carelessly, the same person, can be excited about doing a mitzvah, but also will just casually prioritize their own will over Hashem's will. Um, that's basically love without respect. So we know that respect must be ground zero. The first thing to do is to develop and build up the respect slash awe, yira, that we feel towards Hashem. And like we mentioned, these rules are true for human relationships as well.
So this is both a, a class on spirituality and connection to Hashem, as well as future marriage training. Or even roommate politics. But once you have the respect down, once the foundation is set, now it's time to build up some love. Because love is an important ingredient. Respect without love basically means I'm not going to cross you. I'm not going to step on you. What am I actually going to do? What am I actually going to contribute to the relationship? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to offend you. I'm not going to disrespect you. I'm not going to, you know, you, want, you, don't, you don't like when I leave my socks on the floor. I'm, I'm not going to leave my socks on the floor. Right? But what are you bringing? What are you contributing? What are you demonstrating? How are you building the relationship? You're not destroying it. Okay, that's good. It, it's good not to destroy the relationship. Wonderful. Can we build it? Can we foster it? Can we deepen it? Can we, you know, can we make it into something? That takes love. Um, basically, what there's a few different meditations about love in Tanya. The one we're going to focus on now, very, very briefly, because we're just running out of time, unfortunately, um, is the idea of reciprocal love. We all know what it means to reciprocate feelings. Um, you know, when human nature is someone smiles at you, you're inclined to smile back. We are reciprocal creatures. If somebody does something nice for us, we feel like we'd like to do something nice for them. Um, as you grow older, by the way, and you mature in your relationship with your parents, you start to appreciate and realize and understand how much your parents have done for you. And you start to get the feeling of, oh my God, I, I have like this, I, there's so much I want to do for my parents. I want to do so many things to help them and make their lives easier and, and you know, give them the sense of joy that all the hard work that they put into raising me was worth it. And all the suffering and pain of bringing me into this world and raising me was justified. And I'll do that by the way I live and the way I behave because you can never fully repay them. Um, but the idea of reciprocity, a reciprocal love, reciprocal relationship is one of the ways in which we can develop a love for Hashem. Why? Because we first meditate on what Hashem has done for us. And what I mean by that is not only like your own, in your own self, what he did for you um, in, in terms of your own life, to turn to text number five on page uh, 130, please. So let's start in middle again, because we're running out of time. The paragraph that starts with the word such. Um... Okay, Kayla, can you read? From the middle of that paragraph starts with the word such and like two lines down, it says, how much more so if a great and mighty king? Yep. Do that? Okay, just have Jilly in mind. Jilly, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to find the, uh, the quote right now. Um, hopefully you can follow just from Kayla's reading, okay? Yeah. Hope that works. Okay, so re if you can read from there to the end of the quote, Kayla, please. Okay. How much more so if a great and mighty king displays his great and intense love for a commoner who is despised and lowly among men, a disgraceful creature cast on the dung hill. Yet the king comes down to him from the place of his glory, together with all his um, ret retinue. Is that right? Yeah, retinue means like the whole, the whole escort of guards and whatever. <laughs> And raises him and exalts him from his dunghill and brings him into his palace, the royal palace, in the innermost chamber, a place such as no servant nor lord ever enters, and there shares with him the closest companionship with embraces and kisses and attachment of spirit to spirit with their whole heart and soul. How much more so will there be if will there be aroused autom automatically a doubled and redoubled love in the heart? of this most common and humble individual for the king with a true attachment of spirit from heart and soul from the infinite depths of his heart. Even if his heart be like a heart of stone, it will surely melt and become like water and his soul will pour itself out like water with soulful longing for the love of the king. Okay. 
So the idea of, of this parallel, this analogy, is basically um, the story of our lives. We are the pauper, as you might have imagined. Um, and um, the soul in the body is exiled and disconnected from home. And Hashem, being the king, gives us the Torah and the mitzvahs, which is how he uplifts us and hugs us and allows us to come back home to connect with him, rise up from the exile of the body. So the point of this also is, is a beautiful way of framing all the, we spoke about before, all the brokenness that we can feel as physical beings. Well, the brokenness is only because of all the physical, our body, our egos, our animal souls, all those sources of brokenness. A great way of framing all this is that despite all the brokenness, we have a chance to rise up from that state of disconnection and exile and to experience spiritual elevation and liberation by studying Torah, by doing a mitzvah, by prayer, by all the things that Judaism prescribes, um, we can heal our brokenness. And in the most ultimate way, not just by you know, a pop psychology tip that if you brew this kind of tea and you put on this kind of music, then you'll feel better. That's basically a band-aid. We're talking about getting to the root of the issue on the deepest, most existential level possible um, by, by, you know, putting all that in the context of my relationship with Hashem. So um, Hashem being so kind to us, so generous to us, kind of, you know, warms your heart and touches you you feel, wow, he, he gave me a chance at, at life. He gave me a chance at, at rising up. He gave me a chance at, at doing better for myself than just being stuck in this garbage pile. Oh, my God, he's the greatest ever. No pun intended. Oh, my God. Ha, ha, get it. Um, you know, he, he's done so much for me. You just reciprocate that feeling of, wow, I owe you one. I, I, I love you so much. You're the best. Um, and that's just one. And this is all very brief. And I'm... I'm ah. There's so much more, but this is one way that a person can meditate a little bit and just think about, wow, you know, the mitzvahs are really my, my, my ticket up. And Hashem gave this to me, you know, just out of, his, out of the goodness of his heart. What a guy, right? And that develops a reciprocal love out of gratitude to Hashem for the gift that he's given you. So I know we're out of time. I just want to summarize very quickly the ending um, as we have studied Tanya here, and, and I want to reiterate, this has been the nutshell of nutshells, tip of the tip of the iceberg. If anything at all in this course spoke to you, was meaningful to you, sounded wise and insightful to you, then I just hope that it will whet your appetite to study more of the Tanya. Um, I will mention that you can do that in a very easy way on Chabad.org, Chabad.org slash daily study actually has daily segments of Tanya broken down into like 10, 15 minute classes with a rabbi who's actually my dad's cousin, Rabbi Gordon. So if you go, just very quick plug, sorry, I'm just going to firm, I'm gonna make sure I got the link right. I think it's Chabad.org slash Rabbi Gordon. Let me make sure right now. Rabbi Gordon. Da, 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 da. Yes, indeedy. So you go to Chabad.org slash Rabbi Gordon, and you see it right at the top of the page, there's a tab that says Daily Tanya. And if you click on Daily Tanya, every day of the year, you'll have a video there with that day's portion, because the entire Tanya is divided into small nuggets to be studied every single day throughout the year. And we, Chabad, we're always, every year we're going through a cycle of studying the whole Tanya. So if anything in this course has resonated with you, the best way to follow up in a way that's not going to be like what we did here, which is trying to cram 10 chapters into one class, a much more reasonable approach is to study a little bit every day with a wonderful teacher who explains it so clearly and doesn't assume any background knowledge, really puts everything out there and just explains and explains. And people all over the world love these classes and it's, it's an amazing thing. So as we've studied Tanya, we have learned that we can perfect our behavior. We should expect of ourselves to control our behavior, thought, speech, and action. Though not necessarily will we, will, will we ever completely be whole inside and perfect inside. 
We've also identified our central purpose in this world as transforming the world around us by spreading light of Hashem through doing mitzvahs in the physical world and that our brokenness and our relationship to the physical is our ticket in to be able to live a meaningful life because without the access to the physical and the areas where things are broken, we can't have an impact there and we're stuck being one-dimensional spiritual creatures. We're not bilingual. We can't translate. So rather than be upset by all of our flaws and weaknesses because uh, that come with the territory, that come with the territory of being a physical human being, we should see them as assets that allow us entry to be able to make a contribution and bring Hashem's light to the world. None of this means that we should allow ourselves to indulge our ego and just say, well, if it's good to be broken, then maybe I should be a little bit more broken. And if it's good to be have access to the darkness of the world, why don't I have a little bit more darkness and do some sinning? That's not what that means at all. I'm sure you all understand that. Um, Victor Frankl has a quote I want to end with. He said, that which is to give light must endure burning. You heard that before? Yeah? That which is to give light must endure burning. So the burning is going to happen when we do a mitzvah. We burn some of our ego. We burn some of our animal soul. And when we devote ourselves to serving Hashem, we devote ourselves to our mission in this world to bring light into the darkness by doing mitzvahs, um, we, we, we can become the best Jews we can possibly be, aiming to control our behavior, knowing we're never going to be perfect, but that's okay. As long as we're busy shedding light on ourselves and on the world around us, we generate revelations of holiness in the world. Indeed, we are walking revelations of holiness, walking revelations of God, as the philosopher of King Louis the something said to him when the French king asked, can you give me proof of God's existence? The philosopher who was not Jewish said, your majesty, the Jews. That's the end. Um, like I said, this whole course, the purpose of this course was to tease you and show you there's an entire world that you can go scuba diving in that you may not have known about before. We hope, I hope that it whetted your appetite. I hope that it was not too overwhelming. There was so much information flying at you. If you did not feel waterboarded, pat yourselves on the back. Um, and if you were able to take away a few things from this course, I hope you'll maybe take the time to write it down. Um, if you have any feedback for me, I always love to hear the good, the bad, the ugly. It's helpful to me. And um, next course, next semester, we're going to be doing another Sinai follow-up course. This one will be dealing with negative emotions. Um, so it's also from Tanya, but not as much. It'll be about four or five chapters of Tanya condensed into six classes again, um, all about depression, anxiety, shame, things like that. Um, obviously, again, in Tanya's context, which is in the context of your spiritual life and your relationship with Hashem. But as usual, the lessons and the ideas can be carried over and applied to other areas of life as well. So I hope you'll be able to join us. The registration for that course. What? You said something? Me? Yeah. No. Oh, do you know what time it will be at? So yeah, so the time is going to be, I think, the same time. It's going to be Monday nights. You can look it up. The registration is open on signescholars.com, the same way that you did for this course. I believe I made it the same timing as before. So 8.30? I believe so, yeah. Um, and yeah, it'll be Monday evening again. And I hope you'll be able to join. And of course, tell your friends and your roommates and the whole wide world because if we're going to be on Zoom, we can go up to 300 people. <laughs> Spread the word. Spread the word indeed. Okay. And, and honestly, if, if, if any of the ideas here resonate with you, um, do indeed have conversations, bring it up to people, tell your parents about it. You know, um, if, you, if you have something good and precious, we're supposed to share it. That's the most Chabad thing you can do, is to share what you know. Don't become like some annoying preacher, but share it. 
you know, with a little bit of class, but but share it. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't be selfish. Okay. Lada tov, everybody. Good night. Sparkoni nochi. Thank you. Thank you. Regards to the family. Enjoy Winnipeg. <laughs> Thanks. You're the only one who got to travel for break. Yeah, it's uh, really really <laughs> sunny here today. <laughs> Enjoying the beach. I'm sure. Alrighty. See you Thank guys. You. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye bye.